for the last couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, when I, when I first, I said this the last time, too, that, that uh, Amos is, when I first started looking at it, I'm like, man, what am I going to preach out of here? Because there's a lot of rough stuff in Amos, a lot of prophecies and about doom and gloom and all these terrible things that have happened. But, you know, digging in the Word of God is like digging in a gold mine. I said, digging in the Word of God is like digging in a gold mine. You know, you, you get out, and, you know, during, during the gold rush in, you know, 1848, 1849, 1850 out in California, you know, May, there, was, there was hundreds of thousands of people that went out and tried to find gold. And if you got out there and, you know, used a pan or something like that, you'd find, you know, a little gold dust and maybe a nugget or two here and there. But the only guys that made any money were the guys that got out and start digging. You know, and that's kind of the way the Word of God is. You know, you can you can play around with it a little bit, and you'll get a little dust here and there, and a little nugget here and there, but if you want to strike it rich with God, you got to dig into the Word. Hallelujah. And it's those rich things that we find in the Word that we do not see until we start digging. And we need to dig deep. Amen. So tonight we're going to look at Amos. Always merciful. So we've been using this text, Amos 3, 7. Out of the extended Bible it says, Before the Lord does anything, he tells his plans to his servants, the prophets. Father God, we just thank you that you're going to develop us tonight in your word. Lord, we thank you that we're going to be digging into not the, not the little, we're not looking for nuggets, we're looking for the veins. And so, Lord, we just thank you that you're going to help us tonight. You're going to speak to us, you're going to impart to us truth and wisdom that we can use to minister Jesus to people. And, Lord, we just thank you for answering our prayer now, and all who agree, say amen. So, we've been learning this, that Prophetic voice is valuable to humanity. Humanity suffers without the prophetic voice of God. Amen. The Bible says that without, without vision, which means prophetic voice, people perish. Now that's a direct contra contradiction to the will of God. God is not willing that any should perish. And if we're not getting in our relationship with God where he is speaking to us and speaking through us, people are going to perish around us. We're violating the will of God and don't even know it. Hallelujah. Say amen or oh me. So... When, when Amos was uh, giving his prophecies, when he was uh, giving these prophetic utterances, and, and uh, I don't believe I told you this before, but Amos wasn't recognized as a prophet. He was a sheep herder. And all of a sudden, God started taking this ordinary guy and speaking through him in very powerful ways. So, And these prophecies that he gave about the fall of Israel, he was giving them 50, 60, 70 years, depending on which scholar you believe, before the fall of Israel. So that, you know, a whole generation, a whole lifetime, basically, before it actually happened. And, and so God was constantly, from the time that Israel and Judah broke, broke in two, northern kingdom and southern kingdom, from the time that happened, and you know that Israel never had a good king. They never had good leadership. They always, and the reason why is because when they, when they first broke apart, the first, very first king, who was Jeroboam the first, and, and during, the, during the time that Amos was around, it was Jeroboam the second. No, it wasn't his son. It was a long time in between. But Jeroboam the first resurrected the calf worship. You remember what the people did when they were out wandering in the desert, and, and, and Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, so God had come down there dancing around in his calf. It says the people rose up and played. 
Now that doesn't mean they're just having a good time. They were doing some ugly, dirty, nasty things. No wonder Moses got upset and busted those tablets. Boom. I mean, he was mad. And you know, remember what he did? He ground that he, he melted that thing down and ground it up and he said, You want to have gold? Here you go. And he made him eat it. <laughs> Woo wee. Don't mess with the man of God. So but God was always trying to turn Israel, the northern kingdom, back to him from the time of the split. Turn back to me. Turn back to me. Why would he do that? All the ugly, nasty things they're doing, why would he? Because God loves us. As crazy and goofy as we can get, he still loves us. Amen. So God is always merciful, always warning, always seeking to redeem. Now think about that. Because I hear a lot, of, a lot of Christians talk about how we're unworthy and things like that. And, and if we're so un, unworthy, then why did God think we were worth saving? Why would Jesus think that you're valuable enough to go to the cross if you're unworthy? <laughs> Because he, see, he has value in us, right? Yep. You know, nothing creates value like love. The reason, the reason why there's problems with people and families and all of that is because love has been pushed out of the picture somehow. And because of that, the value that people ought to have with one another, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, It's because love, there's no value because love's missing somehow. Amen. So let's look at this. Uh, Amos chapter 7. So you see the divisions. If we stand in the gap for the lost, they will find mercy. We don't, we don't need that kind of mercy. We've already found it. But they do. Not that we don't need mercy, we do, but they really do, you know, because they're, they're on the wrong path. So Amos chapter 7 verse 1 says, Thus the Lord showed me, behold, he formed the locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. And so it was that when they had finished eating the grass of the land, that I said, O Lord God, forgive our prey. Oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord resented, uh, relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. Now, we don't have any right to get sassy with God, but you notice this man stood up and God said, Okay, I'm going to stop it. Hello? Hello? Because these people have been, what they've been doing, whatever all they've been doing, you know, the, you can pick up a history book about ancient Israel and read all that. I mean, they did some bad things. Oh, man, them people were a mess. We think bad things go on nowadays, and things bad things do go on nowadays. But, I mean, them people had it wrong from the start, and they just got uglier and worse as they went along. As powerful as the men of God word that they sent, you know, Elijah, Elisha, just, you know, powerhouses for God, and they still wouldn't back off of their sin. they just keep going. Amazing. But, but you understand, when we approach the throne of grace to find mercy and help in the time of need, we are standing in between what God has to allow and the poor guy that's going to get it. So, love and value. God warns us so that we will stand in the gap for others. When God talks about, you know, bad things are coming, things like that, that's not, that's not 
just for our sake, although it will help us if we listen to him. Amen. Get out of the way of that mess. But it's so that we will stand in the gap. There's a lot, there's a lot of Christians that, that have made errors in the past, really good folks, really good ministers that have made errors because they've, they've, they've heard warnings from God and they say, this is what's going to happen. Nah, that's not what God's trying to do. He's trying to get you to pray so it won't. You know, Amy Simple McPherson, as wonderful a, a woman of God as she was, led, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord in her lifetime. Yeah, I know she had problems, but she's got a big crowd. She had a big crowd waiting for her when she went home. Amen. Amen. And so when she was, when she got married to her first husband and they were over in China and he got sick and she had a dream and she saw him walking down the road and waving goodbye to her. And she said, the will of the Lord be done. Well, that's not the will of the Lord. She's 19 years old. He's 22, 23 years old. They just got married. She's pregnant. It's not the will of God for him to leave, of earth, leave the earth and leave her in the lurch like that. Hey, man, we've got to learn to get in that place and, and stop the wrath from coming. Hey, Amen. So, so we need to stand in the gap. You know, John 10.10, 10, uh, I just quote it to you, says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you may have life and that more abundantly. So anything that steals, listen to me, anything that steals or kills or destroys is not God. Oh, yes, you know, you know and I understand why people get the idea. They read things in the Old Testament, and, and the reason why it says that God did this and God did that is because the verbiage, the verbiage, you know what verbs are, that's the action words. The verbiage in the Hebrew won't translate over into the English. So, so when, you, when it says God did this and God did that, that is written in the Hebrew in a permissive sense, meaning that this is going to come, okay? That he had to permit it because whatever folks are doing. So, you know, let's, start, let's go back to Egypt, you know. And Pharaoh, he's raising up his ugly head against the Lord and, you know, killing off babies and all of that. Beating God's people. And so all these plagues start coming. People say, well, you know, God did that. God don't have no plagues. God doesn't have any plagues. Are there any plagues in heaven? Do you have to worry about plagues in heaven or sickness? You know, maybe you know, maybe there's cancer. No, there ain't nothing up there like that. Jesus said, Jesus said about himself, if you want to understand the will of God, watch me. Isn't that right? He said, the thief comes to kill, to steal, to kill, and to destroy, right? I came to give you life. So anything that reeks of death is not God. So these plagues that came, who brought them? The devil did. Because they're making a mess over there. They're attacking God's people. You, under, you need to understand this about the devil. The devil's like a lawyer. A real mean, bad one, but he's a lawyer. He understands spiritual law. And so what he does, he watches something going on, and, he, and, and, and then he says, God, I have it. Now, he doesn't go to heaven to talk to God. He's not allowed in there. He, he got kicked out a long time ago. He don't go back, all right? But he says, God, they're, they're attacking your people. I'm going to go get them. And God can't stop it. See, now, when God sent Moses, everybody's got this idea. When God sent Moses over there, he sent them there, you know, because people have, have, you know, preachers have preached it wrong. That's why. But uh, they, they have this idea that Moses was sent there to bring the plagues and the trouble and all that and everything so they could get out of there. No, whenever God warns 
through the prophet, and Moses was a prophet. When God warns through the prophet, he's trying to stop destruction. Now, he did want his people to go free, but Pharaoh could have said as soon as, as, soon as Moses walks into court the first time, he could have avoided all that mess by saying, okay, yep, you're from God, I'm going to let him go. Is that right? Some of you look at me like you're not too sure. I don't know about that. Well, you know, it's because you heard a bunch of stuff in the other direction. You can have faith in the wrong things just as well in the right as in the right things. Faith works both directions. Oh Lord, I need to repent of something. Amen. So, so according to Jesus, any destruction is not of God. When people go to hell, they're going to a place that God never intended. That was designed for the devil and his crew, not for us. So in Ezekiel 22, if you'll look there real quick, Ezekiel 22 in verse 30 says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. So clearly, God is wanting to save folks in this situation. I'm looking for someone to stand in between, but I can't find anybody. You know, Catherine Coleman, she, when, she, when God called her, she, to, to go out and minister, she said, Lord, I don't want to do it. You know, I don't want to do it. I, 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 you know, the responsibility, the things that happen, and besides that, I'm a woman. People don't respect women preachers, and I just don't want to do it. She said, get a man to do it. He said, I can't find a man to do it. You do it. So she said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. Preachers are, first and foremost, they ought to be, those who stand in between. The reason why people could come to her meetings and become delivered and healed in, in the great and dramatic ways that they were is because she would stand in between. Heaven and hell. And she rebuked hell and let heaven come into their lives. We've got to learn to get past this 70 or 80 or so years that we have on this earth. That's just a little, then it's gone. You know, thinking it's so important and, 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 and we're so important in it. And in the meantime, people are falling off the cliff. Because we want, you know, we want our things. So clearly, you know, 2 Peter 3 9 says that, that God is not willing that any would perish, right? But he needs us, he needs for us to pray, to stand in the gap, to intercede. See, now when people say, well, what about Jesus? No, Jesus intercedes for the church, not for the sinners. Amen. His intercession for us is that, is that we would be made complete. That we would mature and become the person that he desires us to be in this life and to bring a crowd of folks with us when we go to meet him. Amen. Amen. So, so he intercedes in that direction, but we're, the one, we're here on the earth. We're the ones that intercede. We're the ones that stand between heaven and hell for people. John Wesley said, it seems like God does nothing except people pray. I'd listen to John Wesley. Great man of God. Didn't have the revelation we have nowadays, but for his day, he was a giant. Amen. So, prayer, if, if God can get the church to pray, then revival comes. Prayer always re precedes revival. No prayer, no revival. No prayer, People are destroyed. People perish. 
Amos 7 again, verse 4 through 6. Thus the Lord showed me, behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. That must have been a sight. Then I said, O Lord God, cease, I pray. Oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord resented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord. So actually, so Amos is having visions, and he sees this vision, and he goes, No, no, God, we can't, ha- we can't let this happen. And God says, Okay, because you say so. Are you getting this? See, when God shows us something bad coming down the pike for, you know, our country, for our, for our state, for our city, for our county, for, you know, our family, whatever it is, our neighbor. He's not wanting them to fall off into whatever destruction that you see in the spirit. He's wanting to save them from destruction. He's wanting to redeem them from what is trying to come upon them. But he's got to get us to stand in the gap. Judgment begins in the house of God. Now, people, I've heard this preached in in the ways that you're like, oh, my God, somebody needs to take that boy to the side and teach him what the Bible really says. Judgment begins in the house of God. And people preach that stuff and they say, you know, like God's going to do something to the church. That's ridiculous. Say amen. See, we pray for the lost when we have concern for the lost. No concern, you don't pray. I'm the same way, you know, if I'm not concerned about something. Huh? Amen. No concern brings judgment. So where does the judgment come from? Well, it doesn't come from God. He's not judging the church. It's the enemy. He goes, hey. Hey, God, you remember Job? He, he was the most righteous man on the earth. And remember? you got to remember, the devil is a legalist. Pharisee. You're watching to see if you're going to heal on the Sabbath day. That kind of thing. If you was a Christian, you wouldn't do that. If you was a Christian, you wouldn't say that. You know, if you notice that Christians don't say that. It's the people that are outside of the church that say that. What do they know about what a Christian ought to do and not, not to do? <laughs> Makes me want to laugh. I don't get mad. I'm just like. <laughs> but without concern, we won't stand in the gap. So. <laughs> Let me get back on this. No concern brings judgment. Look at Romans chapter 8. I'm going to leave that other thing off. I was getting ready to go somewhere, but I don't. Nope. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Thank God we have somebody to help us. <laughs> Woo wee! For we do not know what we ought, what we should pray for as we ought. In other words, we don't know what's going on with people. Even if we know them and even if we're acquainted with them, we don't always know what's going on with people. Sometimes we think we do. And maybe sometimes we do know. But that doesn't mean we know because we know what's going on, we know how to fix it. So, let me read this. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, speaking in tongues. Okay? So, so when we don't know what to pray, you know, we can pray things in general and by the word of God, but God sometimes has to fix 
specific things, and we don't know what to pray about that. So what do you do? You pray in the Spirit. Lord, I'm going to pray for so-and-so. I'm going to pray in the Spirit. And you just cut, cut loose. Amen. Verse 27. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes the intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Hallelujah. When we're praying in the Spirit, we're praying according to the will of God. Some people say, what good does it do? Well, you, when you pray, you're always praying according to the will of God. That's better than praying in English. Sometimes we think we're doing good in English, and we're really not. Amen. Verse 28. Ooh, this is one of them things that Christians like to throw out there. See, everything's going to work out just fine. That's not the context. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good for those who, are, who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. What's the context here? Intercession, right? Is that what the context is here? The, the context is intercession, intercessory prayer. So things are going to work out if God can get somebody to intercede. Because bad things happen to believers all the time. Because why? Because for one reason, they're not listening because you can get it yourself. God will always try to warn you before you get yourself in trouble. Amen. And if he can't get you to listen, he'll try to get some other believer to pray. If he can get them to listen. Hello. Okay. And so when that happens, then all things work together for good. Well, I just thought it happened. No, what's the context? If, if it happens, then, you know, <laughs> I, I've watched people get in trouble over and over again. If all things work for the good, you see, you know, you see a Christian get in a car wreck. Like one of my, my, my old pastor, one of my old pastors, him and his wife got in a car wreck a couple of years ago. You know, got, got T-boned in an intersection. Jack there, you know, he's a big, tall guy, and she's a little bit of short thing. And so, and they're in a, you know, one of these little economy cars. He can barely squeeze into things, so it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't have to bend very much, and he gets jacked up. So he, so he spent about six months laying on his back after that in his house. And, and I didn't know anything about it. If I know about it, I'll try to help. And, and then finally one day I see this thing on Facebook about, him laying, in, you know, because I heard about the accident, but I didn't know the results. They, they kind of indicated that everything was okay, but then, you know, so mo months go by, and all of a sudden I see this little blurb in there about he'd been laying on his back for six months. And I thought, dear God, this is awful. Can't let my pastor be like that. Now, he, you know, technically he wasn't my pastor no more, but you understand what I'm saying. Can't let my pastor. You understand what I'm telling you? Can't let my pastor be like that. So I said, God, we need to fix this. Right on. <laughs> no, he said, yes, we do. What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to get a hold of him and go down there. And we're going to get him out of bed. Good boy. Amen. So I sent him a little note, you know. Can't just barge in on people. Same little note. It's all right if I, Pastor, is it okay if I come down and pray for you? Yeah, come on. So I went down there, prayed for him. Now he'd been, he couldn't even go to the bathroom. Went down there. Now listen to this. I'm going to tell you this because you all learned something from this. I went down there. Now as far as I know, I served the man well when I, when I was under his ministry. Okay? As far as I know. But, you know, we, don't, we do things we don't know. And so God said, when you get there, you wash his feet. I'm like, wash his feet? I didn't do anything to him. <laughs> Notice that God never argues with you when he tells you to do something. He just says, yeah, there it is, you know, go do it. And so I said, all right. So I, I get to the house, and, and I sat down with him and, and talked to him a little bit. And I said, I said now... I, I know you know these things, but I'm going to give you a little Bible lesson because faith comes by hearing. He said, that's fine, go ahead. And uh, I said, then after I get done, 
giving you a little Bible lesson, I'm going to wash your feet. Wash my feet? I said, yes. He goes, you haven't offended me. I said, well, whether I have or not, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you're just being nice to me. I don't know. But God told me to, so I'm going to do it. Is that okay? Sure. So I gave him a little Bible lesson. Then we got a wash pail out. and I washed his feet. You ought to move if you'll get yourself out of the way. Washing, your, washing somebody's feet makes you get out of the way. Doesn't it? There ain't no pride in that deal. So I washed his feet, prayed over him. And remember, he, he couldn't get out of bed. He couldn't even go to the bathroom. He was propped up on the pillows. prayed over him I said how do you feel he said I want to get up okay he goes let me grab a hold of your hands and grab a hold of my hands because you know he didn't get 100% right away grab a hold of my hands and he swung his feet around and stood up now he hadn't been on his feet in six months a little wobbly you know so I said let me help you know he put his arm he's a real tall man so you know he put his arm around me and his armpits up here anyway <laughs> walked him he took a couple of steps started praising God took a couple more steps stopped started praising God went around the corner of the bed praising God he said get away from me I want to walk by myself And then he walked on into the living room, had his hands up in the air. Now, that would have been excruciating. Praising God. God's looking for somebody to get in between. See, he, he, now, I'm, ashamed, I'm a little bit ashamed of myself. I should have known better. You understand what I'm saying? I should have picked up on that in spirit. Now, I'd, I'd think about him every so often, and, you know, when God brings somebody to your mind, you need to stop and go, God, are you trying to tell me something? Amen. So, so God did, did something very wonderful because You know, he wouldn't have got out of that bed if I wouldn't wash his feet. Even though I drove all the way down to Phoenix and all that. Nope. You got to do the right thing. You got to really get in the gap. So, 